All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Laura Helmuth. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. Uh, we have sample copies out in the hallway. If you didn't see, please feel free to grab one. Uh, we are the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States. When we started publishing in 1845, we covered um, the telegraph and daguerreotypes. So we've been covering technology for a long time. And today we're very excited to be talking about science, engineering, and technology and how they can be used to save lives and health and property uh, from national, natural disasters and unnatural disasters. Um, so Springer, or Scientific American is published by Springer Nature, uh, which is one of the world's largest publishers of scientific research. Um, and our mission at Springer Nature is to advance discovery and make ideas accessible. Uh, and that is one of the reasons we're here. Um, we are gathered for the seventh annual Science on the Hill event. Uh, and the purpose of this event, of these events, is to connect um, researchers with policymakers and leaders uh, who make decisions for all of us. And we want everyone to benefit from the knowledge and insights that the research community generates. Uh, and then we also want um, the research community to understand better what policymakers need uh, from research and how we can work together better. So I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of Springer Nature Group, uh, Nature Portfolio, and Scientific American. Uh, and I want to welcome our panelists, uh, who you'll meet in a sec. Um, but first, we are honored to have Representative Sean Caston of Illinois with us today. Uh, and very grateful to him and his staff for hosting this event, um, and grateful for their strong support of science and using evidence uh, to make good decisions, make good policies, and improve lives. So we're really happy to be here together. Um, so I will turn it over to uh, Representative Caston to share his thoughts um, before we get to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Uh, nice to be here on what was supposed to be a flyout day. As I'm reminded, it's now, a, it's now an in-district work period. Um, the, so I was asked to talk about um, you know, the intersection of weather and climate change. I've spent my whole time, you know, long before getting to Congress, spent 20 years in the clean energy industry working on, on trying to positively affect climate change, and since then serving on the Science Committee. And I could bore you with all of my resume. I'm not going to bother with that. Um, but part of my challenge in talking about this is that, at least from my vantage point, climate change is a way easier problem than weather forecasting. Um, and I, and I, don't, I, I don't say that, I'm not trying to be cute about that, right? I mean, Svante Arrhenius, 130 years ago, essentially explained global climate change, explained the linkage between CO2 emissions and climate change. And the math that he did is basically all still valid and works out. You know, Boltzmann, Boltzmann's law that said, like, why is the moon roughly 60 degrees colder than the Earth? And it's like, well, it's because of the CO2 in the atmosphere. We're both the same distance from the sun. Like, that's really the only reason. Um, uh, ExxonMobil, of all people, back in the 70s, they did a forecast, if we keep burning oil, what's going to happen to the temperature? And it is virtually exactly what's happened in the ensuing years, which is to say that 1887 science, 1970 science, basically explained how climate change works. And... Uh, I mean, you guys who have more expertise in weather than I, are we even that close to accurate yet on mid-range forecasting? <laughs> right? We're getting better, We're getting right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what has been both intriguing and depressing to me about my short time in Congress, um, I represent the, the western Chicago suburbs. Um, Argonne National Lab is not in my district, but everybody who works at Argonne is basically a constituent of mine because I wrap, <laughs> wrap around Argonne. And they're building out the Aurora supercomputer, which will be the fastest supercomputer in the world. That's, it will supplant some already really fast supercomputers. And what's amazing is that we actually are now getting the computational skills in our national labs to, to connect the larger global scale models with both temporally and geographically precise models doing you know, block by block Navier-Stokes equations. I don't mean to nerd out. I, some of the people here are following this. <laughs> you know, where we can actually start to connect these weather events to climate, which is, which is super cool and interesting and inspiring because we can get the math to actually tie out on a, on a macro scale and a micro scale. It's also massively depressing because the system is changing enough now that you can see changes in the climate that are factoring in to very short scale issues that are not supposed to be happening this quickly. Um, as you know, as I remind folks all the time, which I, I, I don't mean to be depressing, but um, 
upright, upright hominids are about a million years old. Um, first fires about a million years ago. Um, anatomically modern Homo sapiens are a couple hundred thousand years old. And 50% of all of the CO2 we have ever emitted as a species is since I graduated from college in 1993. Um, these are super, super scary numbers, right? Um, the, and so that rate of change is ramping up. And I think scientifically what we're, what we're hoping to try to you know, stay just ahead of this wave is can we start to now use those weather forecast models to sync some of these things together? Um, so, you know, we, <clears throat> the polar vortex a couple of years ago was a climate change driven event and we could start to tie that to weather events by saying, okay, the rapid, the fact that the Arctic is warming so much faster, which is informed by our climate models, is causing a, a, a release of, of, of coolth, as we used to say in my last job. <laughs> From, from, from the northern, northern latitudes, which is essentially bringing that cold down temporarily into the southern latitudes. And so all of a sudden, my kids are going outside and doing the thing where you throw a glass of water in the air in Chicago and watch it come down as snow because of that ridiculously cold weather, which is a result of global warming and is counterintuitive. But we're able to answer those questions and understand those linkages because of, of some of those ties. Um, the, I could go on and I'll leave the experts here to talk through those. What, what I think scares me a bit and that I hope you all will have good insights of how to pull this through is that some of the changes, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, are still not yet captured even in our weather modeling, much less our climate modeling. So like a, you know, a map of the Gulf Coast draws land sea boundaries that are increasingly inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we start talking about, okay, how far does a hurricane work up inland, which is a function of when it stops being able to pick up moisture from the ocean, doing that math depends on having an agreed des description of where the ocean ends. Mm -hmm. And when, when you have the latest, the latest NOAA report, I think, said that, that we can expect two feet of sea level rise on the Gulf Coast by 2050, um, which means not to, I keep bumming out the Florida delegation <laughs> over here. <laughs> But it, but it means that like if you buy a house in Pensacola, Florida today, it's gonna to be underwater before you've paid off your mortgage. Mm -hmm. Like that is, that's just like the reality of the world that we're going into and what does that mean from a climate modeling perspective? Um, the, I was up in Alaska on a Codel uh, this past summer and they were talking about the fact that number one, you can see climate change happening so fast at those northern latitudes but also that the that the the wildfires that are coming through are are burning so much deeper in the soil and pulling out all of this nested soil carbon and if we're like do we have the ability in our climate models to say okay we're seeing the forest fire coming how much fuel is on the is on the ground that's going to burn to model that which oh by the way in some of these places has to factor in the fuel that's you know 2 feet deep in the ground down to the bedrock that is like a ridiculously scary question to answer, but if we want to predict and understand where this is going to go from a weather, like how do you get through there? Um, and then, you know, to what degree do all of our, our sort of global water models factor in the, the depleting water tables and, and understand if we've got a flooding issue, we got a good understanding of where the water is on the surface, but what's happening on the water tables? We did... This is not in my prepared remarks, but just like as a point of context. One of the jobs that we were working on before I left the private sector was at a winery in Northern California where they, they, they use water to spray out. This, they make high volumes of wine, which is great for an energy developer because there's good thermal loads. <clears throat> it's not good wine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the high volume stuff, right? So they, just, they, they age it in fine aluminum barrels. <laughs> and they use water to clean out these barrels. Um, it's, it's about as clean as you can get. You're spraying out some grape detritus. The water tables in Northern California are so low that when they pump the water up, the salinity of that water exceeds the level that you're allowed to dispose of on the soil in California. Jeez. And... So they do, they solve that problem in a good California way. You take it to a place where you can land to apply it, which is called Nevada. <laughs> and so they were paying for trucks 
to run water that they had pumped out of the ground, sprayed into the tank, and then paying for trucks to ship water to Nevada where they could land apply that high salinity water. That is a crazy problem, right? Our, our great idea was let's put in a cogen plant, use the waste heat to evaporate the water, and basically pay for the whole plant based on the savings on diesel fuel. It is insane that that's a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I mention that because, like, to what degree as we think about California water balances, you know, in our, in our weather forecast, we're looking at what's in the Sierras, what's the snow melt, what's the weather. How much are we factoring in the groundwater depletion? Do we really even understand it? Um, so I'm, uh, I guess I'll close as I started. Climate change is the easy problem. You all have the hard problem. We're doing everything we can to get the computational ability to link those things together and try to stay ahead of it. But I'm, I'm grateful for all that you do. And, you know, for all the young people in the room, this is, this is the challenge of our generation. The good news is it's fixable. The bad news is we're out of time to fix it. Um, so off we go. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for those remarks and for, for setting the scene for why we're here and why this is so important. Um, I'd like to introduce um, a Scientific American sustainability editor, uh, Andrea Thompson, and she's going to lead the discussion. Uh, there is time at the end of the event for questions from all of you, so we want to hear what you want to hear about. Um, so you know, we want you to be part of the conversation, uh, but we'll start with Andrea introducing our panelists. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to start by having our panelists each introduce themselves. Oh. <laughs> I'm Greg Carbon. I'm the uh, Forecast Operations Branch Chief at the Weather Prediction Center, part of NOAA National Weather Service. Uh, we're centered up in College Park, and we're responsible for precipitation, temperature, winter weather forecasts across the country. I'm Kim Wood. I'm an associate professor at the University of Arizona. I actually started there in August. Uh, before that, I spent eight years at Mississippi State University. So I've got the perspective of hurricanes from living on the Gulf Coast and the perspective on hurricanes from living in the de desert southwest. You may not know this, but both areas are affected by hurricanes, but in different ways. So I was really, really glad to hear the talk about our water table supplies and that sort of thing, because hurricanes tend to give too much water to the Gulf Coast, and then sometimes too much water in a place that needs even more of that, but it comes all at once to a place like the desert southwest. So I do a lot of work with observations and seeing how our models are capturing what hurricanes are doing to better understand what observations we need to continue improving. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Brevet. I'm the Kissinger A. Campo Tomb Professor at uh, the Civil Engineering Department of the University of Florida. My research is um, sort of a fly in the ointment here. I'm a structural engineer and a, a practicing engineer. Um, I study the impacts of extreme winds on residential communities, which is to say the Tuscaloosa and Joplin tornadoes of 2011, Hurricane Ian, or even Hurricane Otis in uh, Mexico. Thank you for, being, for inviting me. Thank you all. So I wanted to start um, and see if each of you could sort of describe the changes we've seen in our weather forecasting abilities over the course of your career. You know, what can we do now that maybe we couldn't do even just a couple decades ago? So I feel very lucky to have been in meteorology for almost 40 years now, and it's a science that has changed dramatically in that period of time. Now, many sciences have, but uh, with respect to meteorology, uh, the, the insights that we've gained in uh, a very short period of time of a few decades, primarily due to uh, computing uh, capabilities, have are mind-boggling. When I think about when we first started, we essentially had uh, some very basic uh, numerical models of the atmosphere that were run on some of the fastest computers that existed at the time. But there were really only a couple of models. Uh, and so every day you would wait uh, for this simulation of the atmospheric circulation pattern to come out. And, and those models, for, their, for the time, and we're talking you know, 1980s, 1990s, they were quite sophisticated. Uh, but their forecasts weren't great. Uh, and in fact, if you tried to put any, any weight in a forecast, say, three days out, um, you were lucky if, if that forecast was correct. And I grew up in New England, and I love snowstorms. And I remember trying to 
predict uh, whether I'd get a day off of school as a kid. And, uh, and it, was, it was really a roll of the dice. You, you, know, you could see a storm uh, in the forecast perhaps uh, down around the Gulf of Mexico or off the mid-Atlantic coast, and there was some hope that you might see some snow. Uh, but a three-day forecast was just not reliable. Uh, you compare that now, uh, you know, five-day forecasts are, are incredibly accurate with respect to precipitation and temperature. And a lot of that is because of the advances that we've seen in both observations uh, and in, in computer uh, simulations, and also applying the, the concept of ensemble forecasting, uh, the ability to run many computer simulations of the atmosphere if they tend to agree, if, if basically all of them are agreeing uh, that in you know five days from now, uh, Washington, D.C. will see an inch of rain, um, and there's not a lot of disparity in those solutions, you can be a little more confident. In other words, the atmosphere has patterns that are somewhat more predictable on some, uh, in some patterns and somewhat less predictable in others. And ensemble models give us insight into that predictability. And so that that's one of the more revolutionary advancements I've seen in my career is, is basically the ability to, uh, to run these ensembles and produce probabilistic information that is either enhance certainty or uncertainty uh, regarding how the weather will evolve over the next several days. And really my focus is days one to seven, uh, but we're seeing advances beyond day seven. We're seeing uh, seasonal, sub-seasonal forecast advances, especially with respect to temperature. Uh, and with climate change superimposed on these forecasts, uh, we are also seeing these models generate realistic forecasts of extremes based on the climate change that we're, we're experiencing on the planet and the warming temperatures we're seeing. So the science has advanced dramatically, and it can provide us uh, the tools necessary to both anticipate hazardous uh, conditions, but also make changes to the way we live our lives, and hopefully the, the weather service exists for the protection of life and property. So our focus on, is on trying to message these events in, with enough lead time so that people take appropriate action. Thank you. Uh -huh. So uh, one of the things I, I think about in terms of what has improved, so much has improved, as Greg has said, one of the things I, I wonder about is um, what more needs to happen. And I give you two examples. Uh, Hurricane Dorian, which affected the Bahamas in uh, 2019, I believe, it was a Category 5 storm that stalled over those islands for about 24 hours. Um, do we have a forecasting system that can... Uh, predict when a hurricane of that magnitude stalls because that changed the, the, the uh, trajectory of lives in the Baco Island, killed, uh, still uncounted for people right there, and, um, you know, and it affected uh, the storm surge as well. The second thing that I think is, is more difficult for, for us, and, and again, think of me, I'm the... I, I'm looking at being the forecaster for uh, houses, for buildings, for communities, okay? I'm the house whisperer in the room. <laughs> um, when we have intensifying hurricanes, how do we predict that? Hurricane Michael sat outside the coast in the Gulf and went from a, a Category 2 storm to a Category 4. When we had Hurricane Otis on the Pacific mm -hmm. being recorded at 205 miles per hour peak three second gust wind speed, never has that happened before. What do we do then? So those two things are what we may need uh, even more supercomputers for, but we have to just be honest and look at it and say, well, this is a climate change sending us a very clear signal that things are turning. I'm kind of glad I'm going third because what I wanted to share ties to both of those comments. So uh, advances we've made in specifically hurricane forecasting is the National Hurricane Center's ability to explicitly forecast rapid intensification. Here defined as at least 35 miles per hour increase in maximum sustained winds in 24 hours. What uh, Otis, Dorian, Michael, all these hurricanes did was intensify faster than that. But that's the threshold we're trying to at least predict that. So in the past, the National Hurricane Center rarely explicitly forecast that rate of change because 
it was so rare. Rapid intensification was originally defined as something that only happened 5% of the time. So you don't want to forecast that more than 5% of the time. But due to climate change signals like warming oceans, there's more energy available to these storms to actually to intensify this quickly. Now, warm oceans are not a guarantee of rapid intensification, but it sure helps if you are priming a lot of energy when a storm is moving over that, especially if the storm happens to be moving slowly with more time to take in that energy if the warmth goes very deep. So advances, thanks to things like the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project, have helped enable both targeted observations and improvements in our computer models to better capture these types of events. And a factor in that more recently is things like moving toward open science, meaning we're doing open source tools, freely available software, publishing our models so that the community can contribute to how these are improving. We're currently in the year of open science. Uh, it's a federally pushed initiative and I'm just gonna go ahead and give my bias here. I program almost entirely in Python. I adore Python. It, <laughs> Me too. And it has actually helped <laughs> us improve our communication of these things. So our graphics are now becoming more translatable to a broader range of audiences because we can use these open source tools to target messages to the audience we're trying to reach out to. We wanna give actionable information and advances in forecasting and investments in forecasting have better enabled us to do this. NOAA is now able to give forecasts in Spanish and Chinese mm -hmm. translated with the help of AI that's being very carefully curated by folks who are expertise, who have expertise in these languages and the communities that are trying to be accessed with these messages. But we're able to use these open tools that have been developed for the community to then help the community. And it's a good thing because storms like Otis are making it a lot more complicated to give these messages. When you have a storm that we think is gonna be a low end hurricane, which is still 75 miles an hour, that's you know still strong wind, but then it gets measurements of 205 miles an hour in a three second gust, that was not captured. We didn't expect Otis to get that strong that fast. Otis is going to be dissected for a long time to try to figure out what was it that helped that storm do what it did. So we're getting better, and yet because of global warming, or as a colleague of mine, Catherine Hayhoe likes to put it, global weirding, <laughs> the rate of change to these events is happening faster than we are prepared to improve our prediction of. So it becomes increasingly important to tie together investments in becoming resilient to climate change with advances in forecasting the weather because day to day it's the weather that's affecting us and that weather is being affected by climate change. Great, and I've, I have um, here the slide, you can see the improvement in, in uh, specifically hurricane and tropical storm forecasting that, that we've made over recent decades, which I think is really illustrative of how far we've come. Um, so, so, you know, looking ahead um, and kind of getting a little at what David was talking about, um, where is there room for improvement? Um, you know, what are, what are the, the big problems we're kind of trying to solve in, in meteorology right now? And more importantly, what are the tools that the meteorological community needs to make those improvements happen? Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I thought we had solved was building wind-resistant housing after Hurricane Andrew. Uh, Florida adopted a, a statewide building code and you have statistically significant improvements in how houses, residential communities uh, behave. What I found out in 2011 when I went to Tuscaloosa and Joplin, Missouri was that that has not translated to the rest of the country. That uh, uh, 250 people lost their lives, over 5,000 houses were destroyed during that one year from tornadoes. So to me, one of the things that I think as a tool that could easily be uh, improved or, or assigned is actually measuring the intensity of a tornado. Believe it or not, EF5, EF4, these are all scientific guesses, okay? that's something that we scientists and forecasters, as we go out, we look at damage, and, and we 
back calculate from the forensic information what we believe the wind speed would be. It's not all the technology, the electronics, the components, the battery power, it's there to ubiquitously deploy sensors to measure the wind speeds in tornadoes so that we have a better idea of modeling those tornado loads on buildings. Remember, buildings still can't move, most of them, okay? And that would be a, a game changer in terms of how we understand a tornado and what we can do about it. I wanted to go back quickly to Python because I'm a big fan too. And uh, I think what's interesting about that with respect to the, the meeting today is that uh, it allows access. The open, the open source in terms of the information and also the ability to uh, data mine that information is crucial. And it, it actually goes toward citizen science. Uh, and, and so making this information and making the tools that allow us to gain insight from this information uh, readily available is, is crucial because you just don't know, you know, who, who's the next uh, Theodore Fujita, right, mm -hmm. as far as wind speed goes. Who's out there that it, it has the ability to uh, provide us information uh, on a new level of understanding with respect to not just meteorology, but societal response and the understanding of how people respond to extreme weather. Um, so big fan of open source, big fan of Scientific American, because that's what you do. You communicate science uh, to the, the general uh, public. And the fact that we allow uh, this information to be open and available to anyone is, is crucially important and perhaps provides insight uh, to individuals as to you know how, how they can better prepare uh, both for themselves and their communities. Uh, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, as far as the, uh, the specific forecasts uh, for extremes, so I'm focused primarily on, on extreme rainfall. We had an event just in the last 24 hours in Florida with over a foot of rain uh, right in the urban corridor uh, around Miami. Um, uh, fortunately, I, I have not heard of any significant uh, uh, loss of life from that event, but that that is... Uh, there's a lot of vulnerability there, and that kind of rainfall is becoming, unfortunately, ever more common. Um, some of these events are relatively uh, accurately forecast, but in a relative short time span. So this event, about 24 to 36 hours out, um, yeah, we, we saw the signal. When it's going to rain 7 to 10 inches tomorrow in, in Miami. Uh, and, and so, again, I'm, I'm amazed at how far we've come. Uh, in, you know, 10, 15 years ago, unlikely you would have had that level of confidence that we had yesterday. It happened in New York City back on uh, the end of September, September 29th. About 24 to 36 hours in advance of that event, the signals were there in the forecast that we are dealing with an event that is likely uh, very dangerous. Do not venture out. Do not drive out in the rain in this event. And rain is a really difficult hazard to communicate uh, because a lot of people experience rain every other day in their lives, unlike tornadoes. Everybody pays attention to tornadoes because they're so visceral and violent, uh, and they are, um, and they're very infrequent as well. They don't claim as, tornadoes do not claim as many lives as flooding does, but it's very difficult to communicate the danger from rainfall. Um, and while those forecasts are getting better, they're still perhaps not good enough uh, to provide lead time where you could sandbag or, you know, uh, take action with respect to evacuation. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about heat, but well, I'll wait on that one. Heat forecasting is actually getting, um, we can get lead time out uh, ahead of heat waves, uh, a lot more advanced lead time in many events as opposed to extreme rainfall. Uh, and that's another hazard that uh, we're seeing increases uh, with respect to uh, health hazards and, and trying to communicate the dangers of heat uh, as well. Um, so that's been primarily my focus um, for hazards. Kim? So <clears throat> one of the big things, and it's been alluded to already, are our need for observations. We need to instead of infer what's going on inside a storm, we need to see it, so to speak. Uh, like if you've ever seen the movie Twister, then it would, be, it would be amazing if we could launch a whole bunch of little sensors to then fly around in a tornado to give us internal insights into that. And attempts have been made to do that through a range of types of observations through the Vortex USA, Vortex Southeast project, which I was very happy to see explicitly acknowledged in the reauthorization proposed for the Weather Act of 2017. 
But the same is true for hurricanes. And hurricanes are really hard to observe because they're out in the ocean. We have to fly into them, which, by the way, is safe. I've done it. But we have to fly into them with a plane, and you're only observing essentially where the plane is. And a storm is not a point, which is another challenge we have in communicating its impacts. Because we follow the center of the storm in the hurricane cone, but we don't follow the shape of the storm, the size of the storm, the extent of the storm as much with that cone. Uh, and so more observations inside a hurricane, especially as it's rapidly intensifying, give us invaluable insights into the mechanisms by which that storm is doing what it's doing. The larger the scale of the system in the atmosphere, the easier it is to see, especially when we have eyes in space, as well as lots of weather balloon launches, hopefully. Denver would be great to get that back. Uh, <laughs> but the, for a hurricane, a lot of the processes are happening on very small scales. The scale of like looking out and seeing one puffy thunderstorm cloud, that's small. We cannot capture that in our models. That's why we need that huge amount of computational ability to model hurricanes. But we can only make our models better if we can confirm that the model is doing with the storm what we saw the storm do. So increased observations, which can be targeted to specific storms. We don't have to observe all the storms. That would be great. But <laughs> we, as long as we have really good observations of specific storms at multiple times through their life cycle, when they're forming, when they're getting stronger, and also when they're getting weaker. So we've mentioned Otis, Michael, Dorian. We haven't talked about Florence. Florence was a communication challenge because the storm was getting weaker because we focus on its maximum sustained wind speed and the category associated with that. But as Florence was weakening, approaching the North and South Carolina coast, it was getting bigger and it was slowing down. A bigger storm drives more storm surge, a slower moving storm rains longer in the same place. So a bigger, slower moving storm is gonna rain longer in the same places over a larger area. So it's gonna dump feet of rain near the coast in the same part of the area that's getting inundated by water from the ocean. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine having fresh water flooding coming at me from one direction and salt water flooding coming at me from the other. Six inches of water can knock you over, a foot of water can float your car. So when we're talking about flooding beyond a foot, people are like, eh, you know, it's just another foot of water. No, <laughs> that, that can be terrifying, especially because that water is moving and often has stuff in it. So from a challenges standpoint, we really want to observe more about the entire hurricane life cycle. Same with the entire tornado life cycle, same with the entire large scale flooding event type cycle from things that are not necessarily a tropical cyclone or uh, a severe weather producing event because rain is has severe impacts too. It's great. Har uh, yeah, Harvey okay. was another one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you, you know, this is following on your, your comments, Kim, um, that we often have really excellent forecasts, you know, far enough in advance for people to take some kind of action. Um, but sometimes that word isn't always getting to the people that need to hear it, or they're not fully understanding what, you know, what is meant by the forecast. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways that, you know, maybe communication can be improved, and in particular, um, communication and coordination between the various levels of government, since that is really important to all of this? So Ida in New York City um, uh, a few years ago claimed over 40 lives from, from flooding. Uh, well forecast event, um, incredibly well forecast event, uh, even though this, the, 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 this is a challenge with communication because it was no longer a hurricane or a tropical mm -hmm. storm. It was the remnants of Ida that brought the rainfall to New York City. Um, after that event, uh, the New York City Office of Emergency Management uh, really wanted to take a look at how could they anticipate an event of that magnitude in the future and what action should they take? One of the challenges there is that you have a large population that's vulnerable, living uh, in basement apartments, they may not speak English. So there was a concerted effort at the time to address some of those shortcomings and 
and try to be ready for, for the next one. And so I believe that uh, the, the event that happened at the end of September, very similar in terms of the rainfall amounts. Uh, I think uh, JFK Airport recorded their, their rainy, uh, the, the wettest day on record, and uh, there was widespread disruption in the city of New York on that day. Again, well forecast, 24 hours, 36 hours out. Emergency management actually with, in cooperation with the National Weather Service uh, in New York City, uh, took some proactive uh, uh, actions and decisions to get the word out, make emergency alerts uh, to the public. I don't know, were you there for the event? So yep. there, yeah, so, uh, so, you know, that basically don't go out, don't drive. And I, I believe there were no direct fatalities associated with the flooding in the, in the wake of that event in, in late September. So sometimes it takes a wake-up call, uh, like Ida, uh, for people to realize, um, what, are we, what are we gonna do the next time this happens? And in light of climate change, the next time this happens is not that far away, uh, especially with respect to extreme precipitation um, and also with, uh, with heat waves. We're seeing more and more of these events, uh, and it's practice time is over. <laughs> we need to start making decisions as to how do we get people out of harm's way, how do we get people to make the decisions that are crucial to their own health and well-being, uh, given that, that we're seeing an increase in these devastating hazardous weather events. Uh I'm taking that question in a different light. Um, right. Looking at where we are in the federal government in uh, D.C., um, considering all the effort from the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, on energy uh, reduction and, and s energy resilience, um, I will just throw it out there for everyone who's listening. It, it is important not to think just of energy resilience and not structural resilience at the same time. If you do that, you're going to be spending money twice. Okay, mm -hmm. you're going to get nice insulation this time. The next hurricane is probably going to wash that away, and then you're going to build it stronger and hopefully with more insulation the next time. Um, so that is a communication method message that needs to go beyond the 24 to 48 hours prior to some event. Okay, um, again me speaking as the house whisperer. <laughs> we are here, we want to be here for not just this generation, but for the next one. Uh, in this case, we have a much longer timeline, and therefore we have to make different, more difficult choices. When a hurricane is approaching, that uh, uh, forecasters will know that's an inflection point for that community. The community is very much attuned to what is being broadcast. That's the time when you can uh, communicate to that population that not only do you have to batten the hatches and put plywood on your windows, but you have to think about retrofitting your older homes Nailing, re-nailing your plywood roofing, connecting your roof trusses to the walls, right? Thinking about what your kids will do in 30 years. So I think the, the communication language uh, needs to exp be expanded. Um, right after hurricanes, this is a place where system change can start to infuse into a, a population. So for me, one of the biggest things I've found is we are advancing our understanding of all these different types of phenomena. We're advancing our ability to forecast them. What do people do? And how do they know what to do? And so there's a twofold issue here, which is the what does a person do when they are in the cone? What does a person do when they are under a high-risk tornado day? That's, that's the short term. That's the, okay, I gotta actually use my action plan. We need to invest in long-term understanding of communication strategies so that people are preparing for these things more than a day in advance. Because you will not, if you have 36 hours warning, that's not enough time necessarily to reinforce your roof, to do all of these types of things that would protect you from potential high winds, potential heavy rain. 
So ahead of the hurricane season, we often have a hurricane preparedness week. There's a sales tax holiday in Florida, that sort of thing to kind of raise awareness and get people to do things. But they may not understand that that is a long-term investment because they may not have the resources to do that investment. We have a lot of under-resourced, under-privileged under -privileged communities that can't do take these resilience actions, that can only react when there's an event that is forcing them to act. So a lot of effort needs to go into how do we communicate with our communities in ways that cater to the understanding and the lived experiences of those communities. Because one of the exciting things that I'm seeing being here is I'm hoping to get a better understanding of how to communicate with you all what I do and how we can partner because I want to make sure we're speaking the same language. I want to know what kinds of things I can say that meet your interests, that cater to your needs. Same is true for these communities that are being affected by all these different types of weather. So an effort being made by the National Hurricane Center are the key messages. They issue key messages with every official forecast update and they sequence them in importance order. So when they are most worried about freshwater flooding, that's the first key message they provide, even if it's coming from a hurricane which has 75 plus mile an hour winds. They are thinking about what kinds of information needs to get to that community. The weather program office at NOAA is strongly investing in social science research to better understand how are we communicating information to the people receiving it, and then what actions are they taking based off that information. We can have the best forecast ever, but if people are not then taking actions that cater to understanding the risks associated with that forecast, Where's the breakdown in communication, but also where's the breakdown in resources that enable them to take action as they need to? So there's a whole lot of back and forth, and this is also shown in some of the results from the recently released National Climate Assessment, where we're seeing how different communities are using what resources they do have to be resilient to take mitigation actions, that sort of thing, but also how they're struggling to do so, because those with the money may not realize that they're the ones who need that money to then be able to invest in their own futures. You said so many interesting things there. Uh, so, so the key messages for, for, uh, uh, for heavy rainfall, that we, we write those with the Hurricane Center. So they get into that, uh, that messaging. And I think the reason I, I would, you know, you said you're here today to partner, and I'm here today too to partner, but also to hope to amplify, uh, one, the advances that we've made with respect to prediction. I think a lot of folks think when they hear the forecast, it's like, well, that, that, there's still, I'm not so sure, right? There's confirmation bias. You, you can look around nowadays and find pretty much what you want to hear. <laughs> so uh, the key is that the advances in forecasting have become so good that we, we really do want people to sit up and, and take notice when they hear you know, you're dealing with an excessive rainfall event or an extended heat wave. Uh, the, the science has gotten good enough that those forecasts are very reliable and, and people can you know, rely on them. And so that's, that's why I, I would like to have folks that are involved in the, in the communication aspect of this to amplify that, to, to, to bring people up to speed on how accurate some of these uh, advanced warnings are. Um, and then uh, the, with, with respect to, um, I wanted to, to tr transition to heat because we think about floods, we think about hurricanes, we think about tornadoes, but heat is actually the biggest killer uh, for, for weather in this country. It's insidious, it, it's long lasting. Uh, it is interesting from a perspective of building. Uh, you know, we, we've recently seen the articles out about that uh, highly uh, reflective paint uh, that can actually be utilized on buildings to, to uh, keep them cooler than they might otherwise be. Be. Um, uh, heat is probably uh, the most uh, uh, recognized aspect of climate change, right? We're living in a warmer world, so you're going to see more heat waves, you're going to see a longer heat waves. And I had one slide, I, I don't know that uh, it, it, you know, my, my provocative slide here was Back from there. July. Oh, no, you can go to the first one because I want to do the provocative slide. <laughs> um, you know, th this was, this was mid-July of this year, and you can see the heat events going on in the west. They're burning, and then in the south, they're, they're sweating. Uh, this was the smoke event, uh, wildfires in Canada, also uh, a byproduct of the unusually warm temperatures in, in the boreal forests to our north. 
and then the soaking in, in the Northeast. And they often see, this is the other challenge we face, some of these hazards are, um, are multiple and, and they're at the same time. They may not be in the same place, but you'll often see heat waves associated with flooding not too far away because the warmer the atmosphere is, the more moisture it can hold. So it's not uncommon to, to see multiple hazards occurring on the same day. And so I just tweeted this one out, burning, sweating, choking, soaking. Uh, th this is our changed climate. Um, this summer, as a meteorologist, convinced me more than ever that we're already in a changed climate. Uh, these events are occurring at, at um, you know, remarkably uh, often, and, and the, the heat for the summer months across the South was unprecedented. In our, our 2 to 3 C global warming uh, scenarios, uh, Dallas, Texas, for example, in a two to three uh, C warmer world, uh, which is what, four, four or five degrees uh, warmer, uh, you'd expect to see um, uh, 40 more days a year of 100 Fahrenheit or better in Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, the, the prior climate, they might get to that 15 days in a year. Um, and so in a warmer climate, you can add about 40 more days. Well, guess what? They already had it this summer. They had about 50 days. So, so we're already in that phase, at least for this summer. It's variable. Hopefully we can go back to times that are not quite as hot. But it's already happening. Um, and so the, the forecasts are good. We need to message that. We need to have people appropriately respond uh, in ways that the te technology and science should allow uh, us to do if we, we push, the, push the agenda. So following on, you know, several comments you guys have made, we've talked about communication um, and, you know, the improvements in forecasting. But even with a perfect forecast, even if people are looking, um, you know, if your infrastructure um, isn't, isn't adequately prepared, as, as David was talking about, um, you can still have disaster happen. And we are seeing uh, a very marked increase in the number of billion dollar disasters in this country. We set a record this year already. Um, and we were, you know, I think it was maybe in, August, so you know we weren't even finished through the year, and we had already had a record. Um, and this is both a combination of a lot of these events happening more often with climate change, and also people moving into areas that put them under greater threat. So I'm wondering if you guys could talk about, you know, what are some of the things that maybe need to happen to do some of this longer-term preparation that you guys were getting at that is happening, you know. <laughs> not in the 24 to 36 hours before an event, but, but well in advance so that this doesn't happen as much. Mm. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's important for us to, um, you know, understand that uh, weather, it's a natural phenomenon, natural hazard, natural. This is how our planet chooses to regulate herself. Um, the disasters... They come when we humans, with our hubris, build stuff where we want to without regard to where Mother Nature says. Okay? If you're building on the Bahama Islands, I suppose you need to build stronger than if you're building in Denver. Simple. Right? That's the science part that we're talking about here. Now... In terms of getting to the point where we reduce the disaster following natural hazards, it requires certain things. An agreement between the govern and the governing and those who govern to have better building codes uniformly to empower people to enforce those building codes uniformly and to retrofit the existing inventory that is inadequate. Those are three things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other quick comments? Yeah. It, well, the vulnerability is, is the point there that you're making, and, and how do we overcome that? Uh, and, and that, I'm not an expert, but I would say that there are many things uh, that we've done that are not conducive to lowering these numbers, <laughs> unfortunately. But some of the things, you know, uh, I'm thinking in terms of transportation. I'm thinking in terms of greenhouse gas, right? We were talking about Europe earlier and how easy it is to get around by train over there. There are efforts that we could make as a society to, to begin to turn the tide. And we were talking also about, remember the, the moonshot, right? I mean, there are so many aspects of what we did with science and technology in the 60s that led to the, you know, uh, landings on the moon. If you applied that level of energy, and that level of uh, 
commitment uh, to to you know whether it's um, whether it's improving uh, you know rapid transit, um, uh, strengthening communities, getting building codes uh, accepted across the board uniformly in areas that are vulnerable, communicating to un, you know under underserved populations. Um, th there are a number of efforts we could make to begin, I think, to turn some of the uh, the numbers uh, better than they are. And it's really about reducing vulnerability, reducing exposure to to some of these risks that we face. So for me, I'm going to kind of take it a little different track. Uh, one is uh, I'm a big proponent of transparent open science so that the people who are hearing our messages of you need to do these things understand we're coming from a data-driven point of care. We care about these communities. We want them to thrive. We don't want them to just survive the next disaster. We want them to be like, hey, this natural hazard happened and look how good we got through it. We're going to keep this up. We want to give them hope so that they know they can survive these disasters because regardless of where you live, you're going to have some sort of weather-related risk. And we need to build things to that. We need to accurately forecast those things and share with folks who live there what their risks are. But also there's these opportunities that we can use to remind people that there's still hope because it's really hard to drive change, because change is hard, if you aren't also encouraging people that good things will come from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one, of, one thing I care very strongly about is reminding people that, yep, climate's changing, yep, we are definitely involved in making that change, and yep, we're putting ourselves more at risk, but look at the technology we can use now. L look at all of these renewable energies that we can bring into our communities so that they can respond better when, say, the grid goes down because they have solar. You know, just there are things, investments we can make in these communities to help them be more resilient to the risks that come from these natural events. And then hopefully they can see that and be like, we did a lot better this time. Mm -hmm. Let's keep this up. And, but it does take a lot of communication of what's possible and then sustained long-term investment. Coming in right after a disaster, giving some money, making sure that they've got the tarps back on the roofs and then moving on to the next thing, that's good in the moment, but we've got to invest in making sure that they aren't just going to rebuild the same way or maybe with a little more insulation. <laughs> than what, how they were before that hazard happened because we're seeing that the hazards are getting worse. So we need to build toward the worst possibilities so that after the fact, people aren't coming in and saying, oh, look at all the insurance we need to pay out. Oh, we have to pay out less because they built better? Great. Maybe pitch that to the insurance companies too. <laughs> uh, but I think there's, there's avenues to sort of encourage you know, growth by saying, look what's possible through what we're learning through science and through what we're learning for how we can make our buildings better. All right, and I'm sorry, we ran a little bit over time, but um, our panelists will be around for a little bit if you have any more questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrea. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to all of you for coming. Please do stay in touch. Um, I think all our panelists are, are pretty easy to find. So are we at Scientific American. We'd love to keep talking about this. We could talk all day. Um, grab some more food on the way out. Uh, grab a magazine if you don't have one yet. And uh, thank you for all your work here. It's great to see you.